Hey guys, in this video we're going to be looking at the energy and nature of electromagnetic radiation. By the end, you should be able to relate wavelength, frequency, and energy, and calculate each when given one of the others. You should be able to recall what the electromagnetic spectrum is, and know the order of the different types of energies. And you should know what a photon is, be able to explain it, be able to calculate its energy, and lastly, know what a line spectra is, what causes a line spectrum, and restate what quantized energy is. So let's go ahead and start by looking at our electronic structure of an atom. So when we're talking about electronic structure, we are talking about electrons. Okay, so electrons are going to be very, very small. Very small and fast moving. Because of this, they are going to actually act like a wave. And additionally, since they do have some mass, even though it's very minimal, they are also going to act like a particle. The ability for an electron to act as both a wave and a particle is called the wave-particle duality. And another thing that also acts as a wave and a particle is light. So light also acts as a wave and a particle. So we're going to investigate first light, um, acting as both a wave and a particle, starting out with wave and then moving to how act, light acts as a particle. And then from that, since they behave so similarly, we can base the way the electron behaves on the way that a photon of light behaves. So when we're talking about the wave model of light, we're talking about light traveling as a wave. Light that travels as a wave, or when light travels as a wave, it's going to propagate into space and go on forever and ever. If we're in a vacuum, <laughs> right? But that's not how that works out. Um, but it's going to propagate into space, um, and it's going to have a characteristic wavelength, a trough and a crest. Um, it's going to have a frequency about it. So there's going to be a lot of properties we're going to be looking at when we're talking about light as a wave. Additionally, because it's a wave, it's considered a form of energy. Okay. That form of energy is based on electromagnetic radiation. It's a form of energy in the electromagnetic spectrum. So energy in the form of a wave. is a form of electromagnetic radiation. So anything that is going to travel as a wave and has energy is going to be electromagnetic radiation because it is energy in the form of waves. So we can look at its energy on our electromagnetic spectrum, which is right here. So this is our electromagnetic spectrum going from, in this particular case, highest energy waves to lowest energy waves. Our highest energy waves are going to be gamma rays. Then we're going to go into X-rays, ultraviolet, and then our visible region. So what we can actually see, what our eye can detect, uh, then infrared microwaves and radio waves. Um, so all of these the only difference between them is their wavelength. They're still going to all travel at the same speed because they're all light, right? They're all forms of light. They're all forms of electromagnetic radiation. So all electromagnetic radiation is going to behave the same.
how things interact with electromagnetic radiation is going to be based on the energy of the electromagnetic radiation, but the electromagnetic radiation itself is going to behave the same no matter what the energy is. The entire range of our electromagnetic radiation is called the electromagnetic spectrum. The ranges range of electromagnetic radiation. is our electromagnetic spectrum. So what's again shown down here. And it's organized by wavelength, frequency, and energy. So this lambda right here is wavelength. And then this new is frequency. And then we have big E energy. Okay. And like I said, at the beginning of our electromagnetic spectrum, all the way to the left, are our gamma rays, so they're going to be our highest energy uh, waves. They're going to be the lowest wavelength as well. So smallest wavelength, highest energy. And then on the other end, we have our lowest energy longest wavelength. Let's look at our wave itself. So some of the characteristics of a wave, we've got what's called the wavelength. And this is the length between crests or troughs, or the distance between crests or troughs, troughs, where this is a crest, this is a trough, okay? Our frequency is going to be the number of crests or troughs that pass through a given point each second. And so it's just any arbitrary point. And it's per second, so our unit is seconds to the minus one or per second, which is also equal to hertz, which is another unit that's used. When we think about frequency versus wavelength, they are going to be um, inversely proportional. So larger frequency, smaller wavelength, and vice versa. So we can relate wavelength, frequency, and energy based on their relationships. So we already know, because we've already said it, that frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional. So as you increase one, you decrease the other. And as I said, all electromagnetic radiation is going to go at the same speed, which is the speed of light. All electromagnetic radiation Electromagnetic radiation, light, goes at the speed of light. Uh, when in a vacuum. <laughs> so in a vacuum, we'll have this speed which is C equals 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters over seconds. Okay, so knowing these two things, we can relate frequency and wavelength very, using a very easy equation. Wavelength times by frequency is equal to the speed of light. So very easy. And then our wavelength and energy are also going to have an inverse relationship.
and we have a simple equation to relate them as well. Energy is equal to H times by C over lambda, where H is Planck's constant or Planck's constant. And is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times by second. Uh, Planck's constant is a proportionality constant that's used to relate terms. And then we have frequency and energy. Because frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional, energy and wavelength are inversely proportional, our frequency and energy are going to have a direct relationship. So this is going to be E is equal to Planck's constant times by our frequency. Okay, let's look at our wavelength and the electromagnetic spectrum just a little bit more. So we see our electromagnetic spectrum and then the units that are used for wavelength. The most common when we're talking about the visible region is a unit of nanometers. But depending on where you are in the spectrum, you're going to use different units for wavelength. Um, you could use meters for all of them, right? Meters would be fine for all of them, but it's best to use different units to describe different types of electromagnetic radiation. For instance, if we're X-rays or gamma rays, angstroms are often used when we get to microwaves, millimeters are used, or centimeters. And then when we're talking about radio waves, we're into the meters or kilometers in order to describe them. So they have very different uh, magnitudes of wavelength. So let's try using our equations. We want to calculate the energy of a single blue photon with a wavelength of 464 nanometers. And we want to know what the energy per one mole of photons is. So photons, this is light as a particle, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in just a little bit, uh, but we don't need to know anything about photons in order to answer this question. This is simply just going from a wavelength into energy. So the first thing we want to do if we want to go from wavelength into energy is we need to make sure that we're in the correct unit. In this case, we want to be in meters, right? Because if we think about our energy equation, it's E equals H times by C over wavelength. And our C is in meters per second, so we need to be in meters. So we're going to take our 464 nanometers and convert that into meters, where one meter is equal to 1 times 10 to the 9 nanometers. Divide that out, we get 4.64 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. And now we can put it into our energy equation. Energy is equal to Planck's constant. 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times by seconds, multiplied by our speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters over seconds, divided by our wavelength, 4.64 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. And when we multiply all this out, we get 4.26 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per one photon. If we want to go into joules per mole of photons, then we need to use Avogadro's number. So we have 4.26 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per photon. And there are 6.023 times 10 to the 23 photons per one mole of photon. And from this, we get 2.58 times 10 to the fifth joules over moles. Okay. So, so far, we've looked at just light as a wave, um, how it behaves as a wave. But there are a lot of times where the wave model, which is fairly limited, just talking about as an energy, basically, um, where the wave model fails. Specifically, the wave model fails in three aspects, black body radiation,
photo the photoelectric effect. And an emission spectrum. Or emission spectra, all of that. So black body radiation describes hot objects emitting light. Like what the sun does. Our photoelectric effect describes the ejection of electrons from a metal with just shining a light on that metal. So light causing the ejection of electrons from a metal. And then the emission spectra are the emission of light from electrically charged gases. Not the only type, but the one that they were not able to explain is the emission of light from electrically charged gases, such as sodium vapor. Okay, so because these things could not be described by light as a wave, an alternative explanation was developed, light acts as a particle. Our alternate explanation, light acts as a particle. called a photon. So when light is acting as a particle, we call it a photon. And this is known as the particle model of light. So let's look at why our light or why our wave model failed. First, black body radiation. And this describes when an object that absorbs all radiation falling upon it, all wavelengths of light, it's called a black body. A black body. This is going to be an object that absorbs all radiation falling on it. You can think about wearing a black shirt that absorbs it all. That's why it heats up. And then when a black body is at a uniform temperature, it's going to have an emission that's characteristic of the frequency distribution and depends on the temperature only. So when a black body is at a uniform temperature, its emission of light has a characteristic frequency. And it is characteristic to the temperature. Not the material. So it is temperature dependent emission of light. This is called black body radiation. So a black body radiator can absorb all incident radiation while a black, well, black body radiation is that emission of light due to it being a hot object. So objects themselves glow when the temperature is increased. or emit light as the object's temperature is increased. Okay, 
So you heat it up, it emits light. And it's color dependent. So when we think about the color temperature and intensity relationship, the temperature itself tells you the color. So the color is temperature dependent. We can look at this color coordinate diagram right here to relate the temperature of light with the color of light. So this line that we see here, this kind of curved line, will tell you what temperature, uh, what color each temperature emits. So starting about 1500 or so, maybe 10, maybe 1000, um, you're in a red color. And then as you heat up, to around 3,000, 2,500 to 3,000, you become a yellow color. And then getting to the 4,000 to 6,000 region, you're talking about a white color. And then above 6,000, you're usually looking at a blue color of emission. So this describes the actual color of emission at these temperatures. So these are the Kelvin temperatures and the colors that are expected. And when we're talking about this, we're talking about stars. So these stars are what are actually emitting light. So our sun is yellow in color. So it's going to be not that hot, only like 3000 Kelvin. Um, but the temperature gives the color itself. And we can use a color coordinate diagram to determine or relate the temperature and the color. The intensity of light has nothing to do with the temperature. As you increase the temperature, you change the color, but not the intensity, okay? The intensity has to do with number of photons, but at this point, physics couldn't account for this any of this. So intensity has to do with number of photons. And then just overall, the modern physics of the time could not account for this behavior. Couldn't account for why the temperature or the color was temperature dependent. Couldn't account for why the intensity was not temperature dependent. So, come our German physicist, Max Planck. He proposed that energy can only be absorbed or released by an atom in discrete chunks of the minimum size. So some minimum size. Plot gave the term quanta or quantum to describe that smallest quantity. Okay, smallest quantity of energy that can be emitted or absorbed as electromagnetic radiation. Okay, and from here, this is where he came up with his Planck's constant where H is equal to 6.626 times 10 to negative 
to negative 34 joules times by seconds. So he came up with this Planck's constant based on the idea of the quantum. So when we're thinking about the quantum, this is a fixed amount of energy. Okay, and we can calculate the energy of a single quantum using this equation right here that we've already looked at. So this gives the energy of a single quantum. So they're all going to be multiples of Planck's constant, right? So this is again where he came with this idea. So in order to be considered um, for an atom to be able to absorb or emit a quantum, it has to be in whole numbers. So one quantum, two quantums, three quantums, so on and so forth. So from all of this, you got the idea that energy is quantized. So it is restricted to certain quantities. Or amounts. So let's look at what it means to be quantized. So when we talk about quantized energy, we can think of it kind of like a staircase. And then we can think about continuous as a ramp. So we're thinking about how an atom can absorb energy. That's what we're talking about. So in the case of continuous energy, you can absorb energy anywhere along this ramp, right? So as long as you input energy, you can go do, 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 anywhere along here that you would like. But if you have quantized energy, then you have to reach a minimum threshold of energy in order to absorb that energy by the atom. And that's why we kind of consider it like a staircase. Do, 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 do. So in order to go up this staircase, you have to absorb quanta of energy, right? So with our quantized, only certain amounts of energy can be absorbed. Okay. So it's considered a, a stepwise increase in potential energy. Okay. Next thing I want to look at is the photoelectric effect. So the idea that if you shine light on a clean metal surface, ejection of electrons occurs. So when light is shown on a clean metal surface, ejection of electrons occur. If the light is at a minimum energy. So there is a minimum energy that has to be achieved in order to get the ejection of those electrons. And that minimum energy is based on the metal. Okay. Now, if we reach that minimum energy, but then we go higher than that, we'll still have ejection of electrons. 
So greater energy, higher frequency. Light will still cause ejections. However, lower energy or lower frequency will not. Regardless of how intense the light is. The intensity of light, again, has nothing to do with the energy of light. It has to do with the amount of light. Okay, so Albert Einstein is the one who was able to explain this. So he postulated that right, as radiant energy strikes the metal surface, it's going to act like a tiny packet of energy. So he postulated that as... The light hit the metal surface. It acted as a tiny packet of energy. Okay, and this is where we got the term of photon from. So he coined the term photon, which is our packet of light. Or light acting as a particle. Okay. And that energy of that photon is going to be equal to h nu, right? So this is our quantized radiant energy. Okay, so let's like a little bit more at the photon. They're going to have an associated energy, frequency, and wavelength. So it's still acting as a wave. Okay, that's important to understand that a photon still acts as a wave. It acts as a particle, which is why we call it a photon, but it still is going to have a characteristic wavelength and energy associated with it. So it's just this little packet of energy that's going along, and it's quantized. So quantized energy. So each photon is going to have its own quantized energy about it, and when it interacts with an electron, it's going to transfer that energy to an electron. So when a photon interacts, comes in contact with an electron, it will transfer its energy. Once it's transferred its energy, one of three things can happen. If the energy is too low, nothing happens. The electron absorbs that energy, the photon goes away, and that's it. That's all that happens. If we have a certain amount of energy, if we have enough energy, so some more energy than this, we can actually go up on that staircase. We can go from a lower energy state to a higher energy state, a lower step to a higher step, which is called the excitation of an electron. So an electron can be excited from a lower step to a higher step. 
and this is called excitation. And then the last thing, if we have a large amount of energy, so if the energy is great enough, we will eject that electron from the atom. So the electron will be ejected from the atom. Different atoms will have different energies in order to excite an electron or to remove an electron from an atom. This energy is required to remove an electron from an atom, this ionization energy, is what we call the work function. The work function is that minimum energy required to overcome the energy holding the electron to the nucleus. So minimum energy that needs to be inputted in order to overcome the energy holding the electron to the nucleus. The work function depends on the type of application of the electron in reference to the nucleus. So each atom will have its own work function. Uh, each electron within an atom will have its own work function. Okay. So keep in mind that the energy of one photon, all of it will be transferred to one electron. Okay. If that energy is greater than the work function, the electron will be ejected. If it's less than the work function, the electron won't be ejected. But if it is great enough, it can be uh, cause the excitation of the electron from a lower step to a higher step, going to an excited state. All the energy from one photon is transferred to one electron. If the energy is greater than the work function, or equal to the work function, the electron is ejected. It doesn't matter how many photons we have, the only thing that matters is the energy of that photon to that electron. So our intensity of light has nothing to do with the energy of light, it's just the amount of photons. Okay, let's look at the idea of monochromatic versus polychromatic light. So when we talk about monochromatic light, we are talking about light that is a single wavelength. When we talk about polychromatic light, this is going to be many wavelengths overlapping. So we can see two examples. Here is monochromatic light, and here is polychromatic light. With monochromatic light, all of the light waves are the same energy. So this is going to be something like a green laser pointer, or like a red laser pointer. Right, so it's all one wavelength. Polychromatic light, we've got a bunch of wavelengths overlapping, and this is going to be something like white light. White light is overlapping of 
red plus green plus blue. So the overlap of those three, RGB, will give you white light. So when we're looking at what's called a spectrum, we're looking at all of the polychromatic lights. We're looking at all light, polychromatic or monochromatic, just separated into the component wavelengths. Separation of light into component wavelengths. If we have monochromatic light, it'll be one line in the spectrum. at one wavelength. If we have polychromatic light, this is going to be multiple lines. Or it could be a huge um, peak. That extends over many wavelengths. Okay. If we have those huge, that huge peak, then we're going to have what's called a continuous range of colors or continuous light. And these are going to be a bunch of overlapping wavelengths of light. So all of them are continuous with no or few breaks. So our continuous spectrum. No breaks or few breaks. Okay, so like a rainbow. Okay, so with our continuous spectrum, we see a rainbow of colors. And if we were to think about looking at it, wavelength versus intensity, We'd see this huge peak of all the colors, but we also have what's called a line spectrum where we can see our individual wavelengths. So these are individual wavelengths shown as lines. Okay, so we can see two examples of line spectra down here at the bottom, where if we were to look at it, wavelength versus intensity, these would be sharp peaks as opposed with a big, broad band of light. Okay, so there are only a few wavelengths of light in a line spectrum. In a line spectrum, only a few wavelengths of light are visible. So what happens with any spectrum, you're going to take light, you're going to pass it through a slit. You'll take your light, pass it through a slit, and as it passes through a slit, you get a very small amount of light that comes through, and then it is passed through a prism. something like that, and then it is broken apart into its composite wavelengths to give you either the continuous spectrum that we saw over there or these line spectrums that we see over here, okay? Now, line spectrums are only seen by a couple of things. Not everything exhibits a line spectrum, but all atoms, all of our elements, all of our diatomic elements or monoatomic elements are going to exhibit line spectra. All things in their elemental form will have an associated line spectrum. Okay, some molecules will also exhibit a line spectrum. Um, 
I can look more broadened and look more like peaks, like big peaks instead of these sharp lines. Here are the emission spectra of our elements, and you can see that they are all in lines. Here in our transition metals, we have some very, very colorful compounds. So when they are introduced to light, they produce a lot of very vibrant um, spectra. Okay. The first line spectra that was really investigated is the hydrogen line spectra. And the hydrogen line spectra is the most simple. It only contains four lines in the visible region. And the first person that tried to characterize the hydrogen line spectrum was a high school science teacher, Johann Balmer. And he's the first one to create a, an equation relating the lines of hydrogen to integer values. The equation was later revised when they found lines in the IR and the UV region. infrared, IR, and ultraviolet, UV. So the visible region wasn't the only region where the lines for hydrogen were found, but those weren't uh, initially observed because they are in the infrared and UV region, so they're a little bit harder to find. So the equation that uh, was developed is the Rydberg equation. which is one over wavelength is equal to RH, which is a Rydberg constant for hydrogen, times by one over N1 squared minus one over N2 squared. Okay. And this Rydberg constant is equal to 1.096776 times 10 to the seven meters to the minus one. And a condition that has to be met is N2 has to be greater than N1 for this equation to work out. Okay. Now, this equation has been later revised uh, to include more elements in the line spectra, uh, but it is much more complicated. Um, and it took about 30 years after discovery of this equation in order to find out why this equation works, so how we can get integer value. So what about N1 and N2? What are they and why are they integers? All right, so take about 30 years in order to determine why those were integers. Well, that is everything for this video. I will talk to you guys in the next one.